I believe that's popped up now. So communications manager for the Mid-South and really looking forward to working with you all. The Cotton Research and Promotion Program was formed back in 1966 when cotton producers kind of decided to band together to promote their fiber. They brought it together kind of to offset the large incline and demand for man-made fibers such as polyester and, and things like that. So uh, the pro program has been brought together and is separated into two different parts, which uh, as you heard from most of us on the cotton board today, uh, the first part is the cotton board and we collect assessments on all upland cotton that is ginned and harvested in the US as well as some different products that are imported uh, that contain the cotton fiber as well. So we're, we're the overseer of the programs, the budgets, and uh, make sure that everything is, is compliant as far as USDA goes, as well as making sure that all the assessments are brought in and handled uh, correctly and things like that. So probably the funnest part of the job would be communicating with stakeholders and really looking forward to getting out on the farms and uh, getting to know everybody and their operations and seeing where maybe the cotton board can help help ease the mind or kind of explain to everybody what exactly the research and promotion program does. So uh, we do take those assessments and then create the budget and, and move those to Cotton Incorporated where we contract out the research and marketing and, uh, and really lean on them to kind of develop the brand and, and to push the brand of cotton out to the general public and things like that. So uh, Cotton Incorporated does do the research with local extension as well as universities and things like that. And they also promote the cotton and drive the demand and profitability for the cotton, the cotton industry. So really lean on them to kind of, like I said, create the brand and really drive that to the local consumers. We are governed by USDA. So uh, any kind of publications that we put out or things like that, we do run it by them to make sure that we're following the guidelines that are set in, set in stone or set in the way to make sure to, to keep everything in conjunction and on a similar message. So as I said earlier, we do collect the assessment and I'm sure everybody on the call is probably most familiar with the producer assessment. So that makes up 53% of our total budget and uh, our, the total assessments and um, really helps, I guess, bring in the money and make sure that we have a steady budget to, to continue to do the research and things like that. So. 47% uh, does come from importing cotton, cotton products, so such as the, the different big box stores or text, textiles and manufacturers bringing in cotton products uh, that, that is also has an assessment on it. So uh, better than any other commodity, we do have a 99% compliance rate, which we do take very, very seriously and are and very proud of. Uh, just to help continue to have that steady budget and make sure that we can continue to have the research and promotion that we need to continue to drive the cotton profitability. So like I said, 20, or 2021's budget is down $8 million to a total of $80 million for Cotton Incorporated to, to function on. So even though it is down a little bit, we still uh, due to multiple years putting back for this, for the, I guess, the lows and the highs, we can still stay steady with the research and continue to do the projects that are needed uh, to make sure that the, it's profitable on you all's far farms and uh, we continue to, to build the brand of the cotton industry. So today we're going to be talking about the state support programs. So seven and a half percent of those assessments collected in each state goes to localized research projects. So um, all the assessments that are brought in, seven and a half percent does go to the programs that you're gonna hear today. So don't think that we just take the money from each state and move it around to other states. It is allocated on a state by state basis based on production and um, obviously, the more production that you have in your state, it will 
more money will go back to that and to fund research projects and things. So funding is determined by the committee in each state. So I'll show you here in the next slide who is on that committee. And uh, they collaborate with Cotton Incorporated board members, researchers, and CPOs across the, the nation and then within the state also to come up with what pro programs really need to, to be implemented and things like that. So all the research and projects are managed by Cotton Incorporated Ag Research staff. So we'll hear from Ryan here in just a little bit as he goes over some of those projects. Here's a list of uh, the committee members that are in your state. So if you ever have any questions or thoughts or recommendations and uh, you can't get a hold of me or one of the Cotton Board staff, feel free to reach out to, to these folks right here. Um, you might recognize some of these names, but like I said, we do have Lawrence Long, the chairman of the committee. So really happy that he's taking the, the leadership for the committee and uh, leading it in the right direction, but really appreciative of everybody that takes the time to be on these committees for the state of Mississippi. So kept it short and sweet, but that's uh, the end of my cotton board presentation. So if you ever need anything, or if uh, you just wanna reach out, there's my contact information with my email and my cell phone number. So anytime you have any questions or any thoughts, feel free to reach out and uh, I'll be following up with my contact info also after the call. So. Uh, thanks for the time, and I'll pass it over to Ryan. Thanks, Grant. Um, so I'm, I'm Ryan Kurtz. I'm, I'm the entomologist with Cotton Incorporated. That's my primary role. Um, I'm also the liaison to all the Delta states for the state support committee. So what I'm gonna go through today is just a high level overview of the projects that were funded for 2020. I'll go through the objectives and the significance and just some you know, high level results from this past year. I'm not really trying to influence management decisions in this meeting, just trying to really make you aware of the research that, that uh, your dollars are funding. Um, and, before I get started, I also want to mention we got we have Brian Paralisi on the on the line. So once I get through with the the presentations, I'll give Brian an opportunity if there's anything he wants to say. I'll allow him an opportunity to elaborate on the projects he's working on, and uh, I can also take any questions about the process and how this works. So looking at the projects, um, how they're selected, and the accountability process, uh, the Mississippi State Support Committee. Uh, sets the research priority areas, and um, then these they request proposals from university scientists. Once these proposals are received, uh, Cotton Incorporated staff reviews them for scientific merit, and we kind of weigh in: uh, do do we feel this project um, is should be funded, or is it is this a high priority, medium priority? But ultimately, the state support committees have the complete discretion on which projects are funded. It's entirely up to the growers. We're just, we're just making um, any, any kind of recommendations that they ask for. Th these projects are funded annually, but uh, we recognize that ag research is something that's, that's, that requires multi-year funding. So even though it's on a calendar basis on funding, once a project is funded, it generally runs for at least two, if not three years, unless there's extenuating circumstances. So in terms of accountability, uh, we, we uh, invoice, quarterly. And so we, we pay for work that's done during a given quarter, and we require a report for each quarter to make sure that they're accomplishing their, their goals as it relates to the object objectives. Uh, we also have a final report that comes through that's, that's reviewed by Cotton Incorporated staff and is available to the, to the state support. Um, Mississippi holds their annual meeting in, the, in July usually, and at that time, we, uh, we have in-person presentations on uh, project accomplishments, and they also have an opportunity to, to, uh, to submit their new proposals at this meeting. So looking at funding, uh, the funding, as Grant mentioned, it's seven and a half percent of what the overall uh, production is from the state goes back to the state. Um, 
the funding for any given year works off of a five-year Olympic average. So you knock out the high, you knock out the low, and it's the average of the three years in the middle. For, for 2020, Mississippi State had uh, $201,000 in funds. So this does not include core funds, the, the type of funds there. I manage uh, the entomology funds. We've got other project managers and the other disciplines that have, a, have their core budgets as well. These types of projects are generally more regional or national in scope, but they, they def, there's definite core funding going into Mississippi. So I imagine, you know, in, in addition to the projects we funded with state support, there's at least 10 or 12 other projects coming in with core support as well. Okay. So before I get started in the projects, I also just want to point you to a couple of online resources. If, you, if you're interested in any given year or at any time, if you want to go back and look and see what's being funded, you can just Google Cotton Inc. State Support and it'll take you right to this web page. Um, you can look at what's funded in your state. If you're interested in what's funded in the surrounding state, as well, I know. you can click on those. So, Google Cotton Inc. State Support, it'll take you right there. Um, Another website we have is Cotton Cultivated. So this is where we've got a lot of grower focused information. One of the key things from this, if you get our emails about the weekly weather video, this is where you'll find that. Uh, but it's got a lot of other information that relates to cotton production that, that, you, that you won't find other places. And it also allows access to other places on the web that have a lot of good cotton production information. So looking at the 2020 funded projects, I'm not going to, to list these in detail because I'm going to go through each one of them, but we've got projects um, ranging from insect management to, to agronomy, um, a Delta weather station project, um, weed management, and irrigation. So jumping right to um, these projects, the first one I'm going to go through is support for Delta Council. I'm sure everybody's familiar with Delta Council, but the committee um, feels strongly that, that we should support Delta Council. Um, the support that they provide um, is providing Mississippi growers with current and objective information about issues that affect the cotton industry. Um, the significance of this, um, as everyone realizes, agriculture is playing a predominant, predominant role in the economies of several states, including Mississippi. And uh, agriculturalists are the primary land managers. So issues affecting that management and resource and the health of the regional and national economies are important to cotton producers. So looking at trying to provide current objective information about economic and environmental issues is essential to growers to conduct their business. Uh, the bulk of this funds goes to support their annual meeting as it did this past year. Uh, the, the meeting was, was virtual, but we still su provided support because to, to, for getting the, the information out having solid speakers on the program. Uh, the speakers spoke on current issues relating to agriculture, the economy and the environment. And it also allowed us an avenue to get um, advertisement out to the broader um, agricultural community in Mississippi about the US Cotton Trust Protocol, which is something we're working on to try to, to um, allow brands and retailers confidence that, that using US cotton um, is, is among the most sustainable cottons in the world. Another program that the committee funds annually and feels is very important is the Farm Families of Mississippi Advertising Program. Um, the objectives of this are to develop and implement a campaign to promote the importance of agriculture to the general public and bolstering domestic markets for ag products, including cotton. Um, you, you know, mo most people don't aren't involved in farming and public perception can, can be way off from reality and this campaign is really just trying to communicate um, the, the long-term goals of creating positive public perception of agriculture in Mississippi. And the key to success of this depends on collective involvement and support from all agricultural industry segments, um, including growers. So this is, it's very, uh, um, it's good that, that we're supporting this effort. Just the output of this, you probably, as you're driving around the state, I'm sure you've seen the billboards um, there's also six uh, television commercials that have been airing, radio spots. Um, the media markets they were targeting were around the Metro Jackson area, the Gulf Coast, Tupelo, Greenville, Hattiesburg, DeSoto County, and Meridian. 
Um, the messages um, are focusing on the safety of GMOs, honey as a local crop, environmental stewardship, animal care, and the, and the benefits of antibiotics. Um, shift into insects. Uh, this project was originally uh, funded to just look at rain fastness of common insecticides used for tarnished plant bug and bollworm. They were gonna do that in bioassays, greenhouse experiments, as well as field experiments. Along the way, they, they added a secondary objective, which was looking at uh, developing a dynamic threshold for tarnished plant bug aimed at um, seeing if you could eliminate some of the late season sprays. So obviously the, the significance of the rain fastness, um, you get pop-up showers all the time and the Angus and the extension guys are getting, getting a lot of calls about, you know, is this effective after, after a short little pop-up rain? and insecticide labels rarely claim rain fastness of the products. So you're pretty much left guessing whether retreatment is necessary following a rainfall event. So one of Angus's graduate students developed a process to simulate rainfall events. They did this uh, in, in, um, in a, a kind of a smaller controlled area with, with backpack sprayers looking at the actual efficacy. They, they simulated rainfall at one, two, four, eight, and 16 hours. They looked at bidrin, acephate, transform, diamond, and centric. Um, unfortunately, the, the results, and probably not surprisingly, was the efficacy was greatly reduced for all the tested insecticides. Of, of the tested insecticides, um, uh, diamond was the least impacted by rainfall. Uh, with regard to that secondary objective that was added on the dynamic threshold for tarnished plant bug, it, it looks like from the early results that there's there's great potential to decrease insecticide exposure and increase profits by eliminating some of the later season sprays on, on tarnished plant bug. Moving to the cotton agronomy project with uh, Brian. The, the overall objective of, of his program and for this, this particular project is to demonstrate and publish evaluations of the, the cost effectiveness of pest management practices for problem weeds, nematodes, and insects in Mississippi. Um, you know, input costs for cotton production are higher than, than they've ever been, and certainly higher than other parts of the country, because we've got a lot of pest problems. Um, it's compounded by the development of pest resistance and key pests, and growers are needing information on the efficacy and, uh, and economics of cotton management practices. So Brian's on the line. He'll have an opportunity. If there's any part of this, he wants to go into more detail, but just some a uh, high level overview of the program. Um, the, the, the demo program was initiated during 2008 um, to identify yield and profit limiting factors associated with cotton production um, and then developing solution. And in doing that, they've chosen to use the funding from the state support committee um, to educate and train graduate students to work on these projects. So you not only get solutions to the problem, but they're training future uh, uh, future people that are going to work to help solve problems in cotton. There's no way I could go through all the detail of the results of each project, but current projects that are under this umbrella include looking at dicamba insecticide mixes, defoliation trials, uh, seed size and seeding rates, row spacing and configuration, um, looking at DD60 correlations, cover crops and, and potassium uptake, as and precision planter comparisons, as, as well as on-farm variety trials. Another project that was funded is the Delta Agricultural Weather Project. Um, this is looking at providing weather data needed by, by, by growers to manage decisions and, and also for researchers to document the impact of climate variables on their, on their research. So, you know, why is this important? Local near real-time weather data is key for uh, many management decisions and explanations of crop conditioning, uh, including irrigation frequency and amount, optimal timing for planting, heat unit accumulation, and then tracking crop development over time as, as well as heat stress. So this weather center is providing programming data and collection season. They've got a number of sites um, across the state. Um, they're, they are putting together planning recommendation reports um, through this weather network. Um, if you're interested in checking it out, 
I've got the new web address here. And then once this is finished, we'll probably we'll send a follow-up email and we'll have some links that, that, uh, that I've mentioned throughout this presentation. Uh, next one is looking at the, uh, at the centennial, centennial Rotation Project. I wanna, before I uh, get far past this, I wanna mention two things. One, this is a project that's been funded for at least the last six years. And this year, the Mississippi State and the committee um, discussed providing an annual payment for the next five years to, to serve as an endowment to, to, so that this project can exist long term and would, would eliminate the need for, for funding each year for this to keep the, the actual plots in place. But with this project, the objectives are, are looking at um, evaluating yield, nutrient uptake and removal and soil characteristics in a cotton corn soybean rotation system. And this is, I think, believe this started in, in 2004 or maybe two, it was the early 2000s. I'm not exactly sure what year, but it's been going on for, for close to almost 20 years now, I believe. Um, but obviously, you know, you can look at things in a, in a short term scale and get, it, get some idea of how this is happening. This is really looking at the long term when you rotate these crops and the different iterations of cotton, corn, and soybean that you could that you could do on your farm, and seeing how that impacts your whole farm enterprise as well as pest management. So it's also set up in a rep replicated design. So not only can you look at just the rotation of these crops, you can set it up for uh, various subplots to evaluate cover crops and any other any other thing that you'd like to to evaluate within the rotation. So some results that we've seen from this project. Um, the study includes five rotation systems with corn, soybeans, along with uh, continuous cotton. So looking at the end of 2019, every rotation, every iteration had been through at least one cycle um, that began and, and, uh, and it will begin to repeat, it began to repeat this year. Looking at the 17 average on lint yields, uh, they were greatest for a corn cotton rotation, as well as a soybean corn cotton rotation when compared to everything else and, and specifically um, continuous cotton. And of note, just continuous cotton of all the available options uh, resulted in the lowest year over the 17 year, the lowest average over the 17 years of this project. This project is, is related to that. Um, looking at optimizing cotton production through cover crops and crop rotation. Uh, the overall objective was looking to investigate the potential for legume and non-legume cover crops compared to just crop rotation for optimum cotton production. Obviously there's been significant interest in cover crops, but there's been, there hasn't been a lot of Mississippi specific information generated um, and especially looking at the economics of cover crops. So they, are, they could impact significantly production um, by reducing the impacts of weed and improving water holding capacity. But they're, they're also gonna add to a burn down cost and could introduce issues with early season insect pressure. Some of the early results looking at this, um, if cover crops, if established well, can provide a rotational benefit to continuous cotton systems. Um, in, this, in this trial, the greatest lint yield was observed for the corn cotton rotation compared to all other crop rotations. And looking at some of the cover crops, um, you had um, the rotations where you had a mix, the, the, the significantly greater than continuous cotton as well as these rotations but if you're looking at a rotation the iterations um, of having vetch and, and rye than vetch was was higher than if you just did straight vetch or or, uh, or the flip side of that with rye and vetch so on to irrigation um, the riser program i'm sure you're all familiar familiar with it's it's um trying to determine the effectiveness of, of irrigation best management practices, and then providing learning opportunities for irrigation management tools. 
Um, as you know, the water levels in the shallow water of aquifers are continuing to drop in the Delta and irrigation acreage is increasing. So <clears throat> we, adoption of irrigation and conservation practices is gonna be imperative to helping sustain groundwater supplies. Irrigation application efficiency and uniformity can be improved through computer hole selection as well as irrigation set design and surge flow technology. And scheduling can be, uh, set, scheduling can improve monitoring if you're using soil moisture sensors. This is another project. There's no way that I could go through all the results. You're getting a lot out of this project for the money that's being provided. Um, they're primarily looking at the various extension avenues to get this, this information out. The final report, just going through some numbers on, on, on what, uh, what came out of this. There was four extension publications, five in-person trainings, uh, 11 soil moisture sensor videos on YouTube, there were a couple of podcasts and then 11 blog posts all related to, to efforts that were funded by this project. The bottom of the page, I've got the resource for producers where you can find a lot of this information. We'll also make that available uh, through an email at the end of, after this presentation is over. Moving on to, to, to weeds, um, 2,4-D and dicamba drift, it can be an issue as everyone's aware. So the, the objective of this was to evaluate the effects of, of, of dicamba and 2,4-D on susceptible cotton cultivars where you've got a mix of, of the, different, the different herbicide technologies. Um, obviously with these new, new technologies on the market, um, offsite movement is, was pretty common. Um, and this is really looking at evaluating the damage from these herbicides to susceptible cotton cultivars. And, and seeing how the impacts of that damage on, on economics. High level results. So cotton can recover from injury when dicamba drift occurs early. Um, cotton can be injured significantly from 2,4-D drift at any growth stage and cotton was more sensitive to 2,4-D than dicamba. And overall, if you're looking at the sensitivity um, of cotton growth stage from simulated drift, it's, it starts with square, then flowering, then three to four leaf stage. Um, if you're obviously, um, a lot of the information that I've gone through in, in the, these presentations was very high level. Um, the, your, your, the avenue to get the best um, information on this is through the extension program, but just wanted to give you all a high level overview of where your money was going, the types of projects that were funded um, from 2020 to 2021. A lot of the projects remain the same. Um, these, these top listing ones are renewal. The, the last two are new projects uh, on, on herbicides and uh, weed control, looking at long-term glyphosate resistance uh, and Palmer amaranth control, as well as residual activity of a number of herbicides. Just wanna put this back up there again. We'll, we'll provide these, these links in a subsequent email, uh, but just wanted to remind you of these. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions if you have uh, questions about the, the program in general. And we've also, I can, I'll turn it over to Brian Paralisi as well if, he, if there's anything he'd like to say in, with, as it relates to his program or any of the other projects that we've discussed. Be very, uh, well, thank you, Ryan, for going over some of that stuff. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, like they said, I'm Brian Paralisi. I'm the uh, cotton specialist here at Mississippi State. And uh, just as a cotton outlook, um, I don't know that anyone knows with a high degree of certainty exactly uh, what 2021 is gonna look like uh, in terms of acreage. Um, but I did see a recent report from Texas A&M that suggests around uh, 2 million acres nationwide. And um, I had, I've seen that number before. I think we'll, USDA is gonna put a report out um, I think the 18th or 19th of this month and never and under realistic uh, in Mississippi last year we had 520,000 acres approximately and uh, 2021 I feel like we'll have at least that many maybe a little more uh, you know with the market prices uh, the fundamentals are there to support high market prices for the foreseeable future so that should help but there's also competition with the grain crops, which, you know, um, 
to, you know, could keep it around that level. Um, if anyone else has any information about acreage that they could share, I, I'd love to hear it. But I think we, we might have a little better idea in the, in the this coming month. Um, well, this year at this point, the most recent report I've seen suggests nationwide about 12 million acres. And, uh, you know, Will Maples, our um, economist here, one of them, he thinks that that could be a little conservative. Uh, but then again, if, uh, if the plains stay dry and a lot of times there's about a 29% failed acreage or, or change to another crop, so it could stay the same. Right. Uh, Mississippi, we had 520,000 acres in 2020. And uh, I just guess that I think we'll be at least that many in 2021 or my, that's my hopes. It could, and it could be a little more based on uh, with the prices being higher than they were last year. We dropped close to 100,000 acres last year at the pandemic whenever prices fell to about 52 cents. Um, so um, we, we could be higher than that, but I have not seen any report that, you know, really have forecasted it.